Uh, some of you probably know that the small group of us who have been protesting American policy toward Russia since the Ukrainian crisis began two years ago have been described in harsh and I would say uh, derogatory language as Putin's apologist and Putin's useful idiots, P Putin's uh, American's best friend. Um, Paris should have changed everything, but for these people it hasn't. I clicked on the internet this morning just before I came here and there it was again. So let me begin with a word about myself. Uh, my answer to these charges is no, I, not you, am the patriot of American national security. And I actually have been ever since I started studying Russia, which is about 50 years ago. And I started out in Kentucky. I ended up in Indiana with my dear friend Ralph Cohen, whom I haven't seen in quite a while, but who lives here in San Francisco and is here today, and a colleague I studied with, Professor Barry Schultz. So they can testify I was doing this many, many years ago. Along the way, I came to a conviction, exactly why and how doesn't matter, that American national security runs through Moscow. This was true when the Soviet Union existed. This is true today. What it means, in plain terms, is that whichever existential or grave world threat you might emphasize, and for some people it's climate change, for some people it's human rights, for some people it's the spread of democracy. For me, it has been for quite a while the new kind of terrorism that afflicts the world. It's no longer these so-called non-state actors. These guys are organized. They have an army, they have a self-professed state, and they have a capacity to harm us gravely. Everybody seems to have forgotten 9-11 in Boston, but Paris should have reminded us of what's at stake. So for me, the threat in the world today that gets the priority, and I mean it gets the priority of the President of the United States, I don't care whether he's a Republican or a Democrat, is the combination of this new kind of terrorism, these civil wars, ethnic, religious, zealous civil wars, which drive this terrorism, and the fact that these guys desperately want materials of weapons of mass destruction. A cup this size of radioactive material aboard those planes on 9-11 would have made lower Manhattan inhabitable even today. They're using conventional weapons, bombs, mortars, and guns. But if they'd had it in Paris, Paris would have had to have been evacuated. This is the real threat today. This kind of threat cannot be even marginally diminished. And I'm not sure we can ever end it in our lifetime. This may be the new normal. But diminished and made, probably not the right word, manageable, unless we have a partner in the Kremlin. That's the long and the short of it. Note, I didn't say a friend. Clinton and Nixon went on about their dear friend Brezhnev and their dear friend Yeltsin. It was all for show. I don't care whether we like this person or not. What we need are these common interests and a partnership. The way two business people make a contract, they've got the same interest. They trust each other because if one side violates the interest, the other guy's interest is violated. We haven't had that. We don't have it today, even after Paris. But that is essentially what I've been saying for two years. And in return, people say that's unpatriotic. And I argue, no, it's the highest form of patriotism in regard to American national security. So I will make a few points today very briefly, very starkly, and rather than give a lecture, which actually a lecture for me means 55 minutes. I can't do a minute more, a minute less. Uh, that this is for discussion, and I'm really less interested in lecturing than, he than hearing uh, what's on the mind of my old friend, Gloria. We started out together many years ago. I'm more years ago than her, but in the same geographical location and on your minds. The chance for a durable Washington-Moscow strategic partnership was lost in the 1990s after the Soviet Union ended. Actually, it was lost earlier because it was Reagan and Gorbachev who gave us the opportunity. But it certainly ended in the Clinton administration. And it didn't end in Moscow, it ended in Washington. It was squandered and lost in Washington. And it was lost so badly that today, for at least two years, and I would argue since the Georgian War of 2008, 
We have been in literally a new Cold War with Russia. Now, people don't want to call it that who made American policy during the last 20 years because if they said, yes, we're in a new Cold War, they have to explain how, well, what they were doing during this time. So they say, oh, it's not a Cold War. Okay. It's a really horrible situation and exceedingly dangerous. And here's my next point. This new Cold War has all the potential to be even more dangerous than the preceding 40-year Cold War for several reasons. First of all, think about it. Those of us in this room of that generation, and we seem to be in the majority, know that the epicenter of that Cold War was in Berlin, not close to Russia. And there was an enormous buffer zone between Russia and the West in these satellite or bloc countries in Eastern Europe. Today, the epicenter is literally on Russia's borders in Ukraine. It's Ukraine that set this off. And Ukraine remains the ticking time bomb politically. And this is not only on Russia's borders. This is through the heart of Russia's and Ukrainians' Slavic civilization. This is a civil war even more profound in its ethos than was the American Civil War. These are people who were raised in the same faith, speak the same language, are intermarried. Any of you know how many intermarried Russian and Ukrainians there are today? Uh, my wife, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, uh, to paraphrase John Kennedy, I came, I accompanied Katrina Vanden Heuvel to uh, San Francisco. You'll remember John Kennedy's famous remark about his wife, or you won't. But that <laughs> this is profound division, and this issue for all the terrorism, continues to be the ticking time bomb that can do a lot more damage. So but the fact that it's right on Russia's border and in, so to speak, the Russian-Ukrainian soul, soul, at least half of Ukrainian soul, the other half yearns for Western Europe, fair enough, makes it even more dangerous. Still worse, you'll remember that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Moscow and Washington developed certain rules of mutual conduct. They saw how dangerous, how close we came to nuclear war. So no-nos, whether they were encoded in treaties or unofficial understandings between Soviet and American leaders, you don't do this. Each side knew where the red line was. Now, we tripped over it occasionally, but we immediately pulled back because there was a mutual understanding that there are red lines. There are no red lines today. One of the things that Putin and his predecessor Medvedev keep saying to Washington, you're crossing our red lines. And Washington says there are no red lines. You don't have any red lines. We have red lines. I mean, you can't have a military base in Canada or Mexico but we can have all we want around your borders. Red lines don't exist. So there are no rules. And stop and think. In recent years, there have been three proxy wars between the United States and Russia already. Georgia in 2008, Ukraine beginning in 2014, and until Paris, and maybe still in Syria, because we don't know what position Washington's going to take on Syria. Alain made his decision. He declared a grand alliance with Russia. Washington, as they say in Russia, is silent, or worse. But we're waiting to see if this new proxy Cold War goes on, and there are no rules in any of these three areas. Moreover, and I feel this, because I remember the, I'm old enough to remember the 70s and 80s, there is absolutely no effective organized anti-Cold War pro detente political force in the United States at all not in either political party, not in the White House, not in the State Department, not in the mass media, not in the universities, not in the think tanks. I see Sharon Tennyson, who's here, nodding her head yes, because we remember when we had allies, even in the White House, among aides of the presidents, where we had allies in the State Department, and we had senators and members of Congress who were pro detente and supported us and spoke for themselves and gave us opportunities. Doesn't exist today. And without that, in a democracy, what do you do? We don't throw bombs. We argue. So this is exceedingly dangerous. My fourth point is a question to you. Who's responsible for this new Cold War? And I don't ask this question because I want to say, oh, 
All right, let's name names, since they've probably been here. Gary Kasparov and Michael Fall should repent, repent. And they say Stephen Cohen should be shot. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in a change of policy, which can only come from the White House. Congress could help. But we need to know what went wrong and why, or we're not going to have any rethinking and we're not going to have any new policy. And at the moment, there's no rethinking in the United States. There's a lot in the European Parliament. There's a lot of angst in the French press today about this question, and in Germany, and in the Netherlands. And even Cameron is rethinking. Suddenly wants his picture taken with Putin. Thinks it might help him at home. Now, the position of the American political media establishment is, is that this new Cold War is all Putin's fault. All of it. Everything. We did nothing wrong. At every stage, we were virtuous and wise, and he was aggressive and a bad man. And therefore, what's to rethink? He's got to do the rethinking, not us. I disagree, and this is what's brought the opprobrium down on me, of saying, because I was raised like this down in Kentucky, it's a silly adage, but it's probably true. There are two sides to every story. And these people are actually telling us no to this story of the history of American-Russian relations. There's only one side. No need to see anything through the other person's eyes. Just get out there and be a cheerleader for our side of the story. And I don't want to make too fine of a connection here, but you keep doing that and you're going to have a lot of Parises, including here in the United States. And that's why I say we have to be patriots of American national security. The reality is, for whatever reasons, the Clinton administration adopted in the 1990s a winner-take-all policy toward Russia. They said, we won the Cold War. That isn't true. Get Jack Matlock out here, and he'll tell you the inside story. He was at Reagan's side when he negotiated with Gorbachev at every step. You can look it up, as Casey Stengel used to say. The reality is the Clinton administration adopted unwise policies, winner-take-all. And what were the consequences of these policies? Well, they were a lot. They blew the chance for a strategic uh, partnership. But the four policies that most offended Russia and offend them today were the following. Obviously, the decision to expand NATO right to Russia's borders. I mean, it's a joke. We say Putin has violated the post-Cold War order of Europe. Russia was excluded from the post-World War, post-Cold post -Cold War order of Europe by NATO expansion. Russia was pushed somewhere out there. And Russia kept saying, hey, let's do a pan-European security arrangement, like Gorbachev and Reagan said. And we said, this is, no, this, is, this is not military. This is about democracy and free trade. It's going to be great for you. Swallow your poison with a smile. And while they had no choice, they did. And then when they had a choice, not. They start pushing back as any leader of Russia would who was sober and had support in his own country. I don't say that as a joke. He was a diva. Yel by the end, look at the pictures. Yeltsin could barely walk. He was pushed out. He didn't resign voluntarily. But the point of it is, is anybody could have predicted this back in the 1990s, and some of us did. Secondly, there's the absolute refusal on the part of the United States to negotiate on missile defense. Missile defense is now a NATO project. That means missile defense, building installations, whether it's on land or sea, sea is more dangerous, whether land or sea, is now part of NATO expansion and encirclement of Russia. It's part of the same system. Russians, Russians are absolutely convinced it's targeted at their nuclear retaliatory um, capability. We say, oh, no, it's about Iran. It's not about you. But go talk to Ted Postal at MIT. Stage four missile defense is an offensive weapon. It also violates the INF agreement because it can fire cruise missiles. Why we're blaming the Russians for developing cruise missiles again, as they are. Because we're back in this tit-for-tat, mutual build-up arms race. Thirdly, this meddling in Russia's internal affairs in the name of democracy promotion. We've been doing this since the 90s. Are you aware that when Medvedev was president of Russia and Mrs. Clinton and Michael McFaul had their wondrous reset, which was a rigged roulette game, if you look at the terms of it, that Vice President Biden went to Moscow University and said, Putin should not return to the presidency. 
and then said that directly to Putin's face? So Putin comes over here next week and tells Rubio he thinks he ought to drop out. And we say, well, okay. I mean, are, are there any red lines left anymore when it comes to Russia? Do we have the right to be telling them? I mean, it extends to every issue, but it certainly extends to politics. And the White House simply can't keep its mouth shut. And it's egged on by vested lobbies. We all believe in democracy, but you're not going to impose democracy on Russia. And if it is, you won't like the democracy you get there. So, ask yourself two questions. Is there a Russian side of this story that needs to be considered, in the aftermath of Paris at least? And does Russia have any legitimate national interests at all in the world? And if so, what are they? On their borders? Do they have a legitimate national interest in Syria? Israel thinks so. The Israeli security people and leadership urged Putin to do what he did long before Paris. We need to think this through. My final point is one of, I would say, kind of sappy prescriptive hope. Because until Paris happened, I wasn't sure there was any hope at all. There's still a chance to achieve this lost partnership with Russia, at least in three realms. First of all, Ukraine. You all know what the Minsk Accords are. They were, they were, they were drafted by Merkel and by Alain. They were signed by Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, and by Putin, and they call for a negotiated end to the civil war in Ukraine. They recognize that it is primarily a civil war, not primarily, though secondarily, Russian aggression. But the civil war has to be ended, and it's steps. Here's what you got to do, and I don't care what the American media tells you. It's Kiev that has refused to follow through on its obligations. But this is a possibility. And to end that civil war or mute it down would be exceedingly security building today. Then there's Syria. I thought that until Paris, there was almost no chance of an American coalition with Russia and Syria. Partly to do, I think, with, and I'm not big on psychological analysis, but with o Obama's mind fix about Putin. He resents him in ways that are not helpful. But since Paris, with Alain announcing, I mean literally announcing, that there is now a French-Russian coalition, with Germany agreeing, and I would say almost all of Western Europe on board. And with a poll in Le Figaro sent to me just this morning that when asked, and it's a rather conservative readership of Le Figaro, do you favor a full coalition with Russia against terrorism, 87% said yes. And these are French conservatives. Finally, there's one thing we all forget. And it was another disservice of the Clinton administration, and to a certain extent of Bush in his electoral campaign for re-election, that with the end of the Soviet Union, the nuclear threat ended. And we were, told, we were told all the time the danger of nuclear war had ended with the Soviet Union. The reality is it grew, whether by intent, whether by accident, whether by theft of nuclear materials, it got worse. Last year, in an unwise peak of anger of all the legislation we'd passed, Russia withdrew from the Nunn-Lugar bill, which you might remember, which was one of the wisest pieces of congressional legislation. We gave Russia money to, to lock down and secure all their weapons and materials of mass destruction, plus pay their scientists who knew how to do this stuff and might go to Syria or Yemen or wherever or the, to the Caucasus and sell their knowledge to employ them. Russia withdrew, but Russia has said it wants to renegotiate this on different terms. The White House has refused. I mean, lordy, lordy, after Paris, one hopes Obama picked up whether his cell phone or whatever they let him use to talk to Putin and said, I'm sending somebody over, let's get this done. Unfortunately, in today's paper, the lead news seems to be that what they're thinking about in the White House and in the State Department is how to counter Russian actions in Syria. They're worried, and this is what is reported, that Russia is diminishing American leadership in the world. And here's the bottom line. We don't lead in the world anymore, and we can't. Long before this, globalization, all sorts of developments, they're slow, they're bumper stickers, but the unipolar, monopolar world is over. There's a multipolar world emerging before our eyes, not just Russia, but in five or six capitals. And Washington's stubborn resistance to embrace this has become part of the problem, not the solution. And that's where we are today, after Paris.